Ryan will tell us about um, quantum versus optical annealing. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to present to this conference about some of our work on what we call the coherent icing machine and how that might relate to this community in terms of the comparison that we've done between the icing machine and D-Wave. A brief outline of my talk. I'm first going to introduce the coherent icing machine to everyone because I know that's not particularly familiar, something you are particularly familiar with. And after introducing it, I'll uh, re microphone not working? Oh, closer? Okay. And after introducing how the icing machine works, I'll talk about uh, some of the recent uh, theoretical and experimental results that have come out of this machine. And then we can get to the key result of this talk, which is the comparison with the D-Wave machine, in particular focusing on um, um, benchmarking with max, max cut problems on a number of different graphs, including 1D chains, cubic graphs, and dense graphs. So let's start with the coherent icing machine. I think by this point, this is all review for this audience. The icing model is, uh, it is this particular Hamiltonian, where sigma i, sigma j are spins, and you have a, you have a quadratic coupling, j i j, sigma i, sigma j. And it, I think I neglected also the Zeeman term for the h i, sigma i as well. And this is very fundamental to not just the quantum annealing community, but also statistical mechanics. And as a result, these models have been studied very much, in very much detail classically. But it's also relevant for computer science because it's known that this arbitrary icing problem is NP hard, which means that it is at least as hard as particular problems called NP complete problems, which uh, are known to be a very broad class of important optimization problems. Yeah, so that's a good point. So they're, they're, they're different. Yeah, they're different classes of models. And if uh, if sigma is a one-dimensional vector of uh, of norm one, then this is, does reduce to the icing model. I put it in this general form because we're also interested in studying things like the X Y model, which can also be mapped into these optical machines. And in that case, sigma is a two-dimensional vector. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I mean, they're very related for in terms of the objects that we use. Okay. <laughs> so, getting more into the physics, um, this I'm going to be talking about the machine that we've built, which is called the coherent icing machine, and it was built in, as part of this uh, program called the Impact Program, um, sponsored by the Japanese government. The idea is to build an optical machine, which was originally called the coherent icing machine, and now the term quantum artificial brain is also being used to solve all of these problems that can be mapped to the icing problem. So in the uh, popular literature, you'll see pictures like this, where we say that we are re replacing digital computers with this thing that we call an artificial quantum brain that is supposed to um, dramatically reduce computation times. And I'm going to tell you in this uh, talk how the quantum artificial brain works. And in essence, it is all based on this component called the optical parametric oscillator. So all of you, or most of you, are physicists, and you're familiar with how oscillators work. If I have a pendulum, I can drive the pendulum by moving its pivot left and right. But I can also drive a pendulum by moving its pivot up and down as long as I move the pivot up and down at twice the frequency of the pendulum. And this is called parametric drive for a mechanical pendulum. And a similar effect occurs in optics if you have this thing called a degenerate chi-2 nonlinearity. Degenerate chi-2 nonlinearity converts pump photons of frequency 2 omega to signal photons of frequency omega. And this effect ends up being equivalent to converting energy at twice the frequency of a mechanical oscillator to uh, uh, sideways motion at the frequency omega. Um, 
it uh, gives rise, it's very different from driving the oscillator in the horizontal direction because it gives rise to gain in both the positive and negative direction. So in these diagrams here, I'm plotting the real and imaginary part of the optical field amplitude. If the pump is off, you stay in the vacuum state. If the pump is below a certain threshold, you have parametric gain, but because that parametric gain is less than the cavity loss, you don't leave uh, the vacuum state. So you end up with a squeezed vacuum state. But if the pump is stronger than the threshold value, then you get runaway gain, which eventually gets saturated by the finite energy in your pump. So in this way, the optical parametric oscillator lets you create a system with a quantum bifurcation where you start in the ground state and then you end up in either the plus or minus uh, alpha coherent states. And w the bits that we're going to use or the icing spins we're going to use are going to be encoded in which of these two states you live in at uh, when you're above threshold. The coherent icing machine is just a network of such OPOs. So if I have one OPO and I'm above threshold, I have two possible states. If I have n OPOs, then if I'm above threshold, I have two to the n possible states. And in the absence of any coupling, these states are all degenerate and they all have effectively the same threshold. And if I drive this above threshold, from below to above threshold, each of those states will have identical occupation probability. But if I introduce optical couplings between these OPOs at the signal frequencies, then that breaks the degeneracy between these uh, two to the n modes, favoring one over the others. And there is a way in which you can map the icing Hamiltonian to the types of op optical couplings you use in this OPO network. And there have been several ways we have attempted to explain this in the past. The first is a, an oscillation threshold model, and this is think of, thinking of the icing machine as a laser. And each of these two to the n oscillate, oscillating configurations having a certain occupation probability. In the laser description, when you're below threshold, each of these lasing configurations has its own threshold, and when you're below the minimum threshold, all of them have roughly equal probability. But if you go above um, the lowest threshold, then that configuration should laze at the expense of the others, causing that configuration to be picked at the end of your computation. Now that's uh, nice and intuitive, but there are some fundamental problems with that, one which may have to do with the linearity of quantum mechanics. So we don't think that this is literally what's happening in the machine. Another interpretation ties this into quantum annealing, and this is related to the poster by Hayato Goto two days ago, and also the talk that's going to be given by Shruti Puri uh, tomorrow, which is that it's possible to relate uh, this process of going from below to above threshold to um, quantum annealing in the sense that the below threshold state is um, a squeeze state for small squeezing is equivalent to a linear superposition of two states, uh, two coherent states. And when you go above threshold, you drop out into one of those coherent states. So this can all mathematically be related to quantum annealing. But the problem is that our machines don't work in that limit you know, by a factor of 10 to the 6. So what's most likely a, the best explanation for this icing machine is that it's a semi-classical device that works based on a series of bifurcations and where uh, when you pass through the threshold, the largest uh, lasing mode, and there are only n modes, gets excited and that eventually saturates in some complicated nonlinear process. And that seems to agree with some of the experiments we've done. In terms of some of the experiments, um, we have, we started with four to 16 bit small devices and then we moved up to larger and larger icing machines, mainly focusing on this problem, the max cut problem. So this is a problem where you have a graph and you want to partition the graph into two sets so that you maximize the number of edges that are cut in the graph. In this case, you cut six edges. 
And that's known, that's nice because JIJ is uh, very easy to program in. It's either zero or one. And it's also NP hard for generic graphs. There are number, also a, a large number of good heuristic algorithms to compare this against. In terms of experimental apparatus, a single OPO is pretty straightforward to build. Um, that is also the n equals one Ising machine. It gives you either plus or minus one ground states with a random probability. So that's a quantum random number generator. We don't build n separate cavities for an n OPO Ising machine because that's very difficult. Instead, we build a single cavity and we synchronously pump it with a pump laser that has a repetition rate 10 times n times the repetition rate of the cavity. So in that way, you can store n pulses in this cavity. They are all identical in terms of their threshold, but uh, they are independent of each other. Unless you introduce these delay line couplings, which can couple neighbors or next neighbors or so on between your pulses. And that was demonstrated in later work in 2014 and then in 2016, going from one to four to 16 bits. The problem with all of this is that uh, the more bits you include, the more delay lines you need to stabilize, which is difficult optically. So we didn't pursue this route, uh, work beyond n equals 16. We, uh, another problem is that uh, you can only get graphs with uh, cyclic time translation symmetry here. So this couples pulse one to pulse two and also pulse two to pulse three and so on. And that's a pretty restrictive constraint. Unless you have uh, dynamic uh, delay lines with, say, EOMs. So instead, to get a fully general coupling, we developed this measurement feedback device. So the measurement feedback icing machine is very much like the optical icing machine. You have your OPO here, with, uh, uh, but in, you replace your N delay lines with this single delay line. And this single delay line is special in the sense that Instead of just delaying pulses, it measures the amplitudes of pulses. It computes the effect you should get from end delay lines, and then it re-injects that into the cavity. And that requires pretty fast and sophisticated electronics, which is done with uh, ADCs, D DACs, and an FPGA. And this was recent work that just came out last year in science by both a Stanford team and an NTT team, both working under this impact project. And a good example I'll show in this video here. Here we're looking at the max cut problem on this Mobius ladder graph. We have started largely in the ferromagnetic state, but that is not obviously not the optimum. We've only cut a couple of lines there. The, this shows the amplitudes of all of those OPOs from 1 to 16, and this shows the cut that you get if you just took the solution at that time. As you can see, it started off noisy because you have um, quantum, uh, you have uh, quantum shot noise in your system, but eventually the system uh, undergoes this bifurcation, and then it settles out into a state that maximizes the cut. And for very general problems, you can show that this gets, uh, for these n equals 16 problems, that it gets reasonably high success probability. We're also looking at other applications to this, including uh, Boltzmann sampling. This was worked by Hiro and drug discovery, worked by Hiramasa Sakaguchi. Also compressed sensing. You should, I hope that, that you all saw Ryoji Miyazaki's poster yesterday. And some work done benchmarking this against uh, other neural network models implemented on PZ. And I hope you got a chance to see Ishikawa's poster on Tuesday as well. It was unrelated, but he works with Yoshitaka on this project. Now I'd like to discuss our comparisons with the D-Wave quantum annealer. You guys all know how a quantum annealer works. It's based on the, well, it's inspired by the adiabatic uh, theorem. And in particular, the D-Wave quantum annealer has this type of a chimera graph. The one that we worked on is the one at NASA Ames that has uh, about 1,100 qubits on a 12 by 12 by 8 chimera graph. And in the future, we hope to work on the 2,000-bit machine once that gets installed at NASA. And I hope you heard uh, Lanting's talk about that on Monday. 
comparing the D-Wave to the icing machine, the, well, both the icing machines have fundamentally different uh, hardware. And also, this graph, well, this table shows the different specs of the different machines. So the standard and NPT machines, unlike the D-Wave machine that is restricted to the Chimera graph, they have full all-to-all -all couplings because of this FPGA system. And, and they have comparable anneal times. The NDT machine has a faster laser, so it gets the same anneal time as the Stanford machine, and which falls within the range that's used for D-Wave. And we decided to compare these two machines against D-Wave for uh, these three classes of graphs. First is a 1D chain. Uh, of varying lengths. The next are different types of cubic graphs, where each vertex has three edges. And the next are dense graphs, where on average half of the edges are populated. For the 1D chains, we actually used this uh, all optical coupling machine, but you'd get similar performance. This was worked by NTT a couple years ago. In this case, uh, there is a delay line. It realizes this 1D coupling, and you get, uh, you generally don't get to the ground state because it's such a large problem. You reach these excited low-lying excited states with domain walls. And the number of domain walls is really the figure of merit here. If you had zero domain walls, that's the ground state. If you have 100 domain walls, that's a very excited state. And we can compare the domain wall density, which is a function of the pump amplitude near threshold of the icing machine, to the domain wall density that we got on D-Wave runs, and the D-Wave does slightly better here. But we also think the D-Wave was not particularly optimized when we ran it this time, and we think we could improve this number. As for cubic graphs, that's more non-trivial. We, this was data for the small cubic graphs in McMahon's paper with the measurement feedback device. For the D-Wave, you have to embed these into the hardware, so there's some extra degrees of freedom, in particular the strength of the embedding constraint. But if you pick that correctly, you find that it does significantly better than the icing machine. In terms of uh, larger uh, cubic graphs, well, you have to, it becomes harder and harder to embed the larger these graphs get. And of course, you see a fall off uh, with the probability of the ground state as these problems get larger. But for these uh, sparse cubic graphs, the D-Wave machine does seem to be doing better than the icing machine, both in terms of the overall constant and possibly also in terms of scaling. But where the icing machine really shines is in these all-to-all, -all, or nearly all-to-all, -all, dense graphs. So this is, the, this is data for the D-Wave success probabilities for dense graphs as a function of the graph size. And you can see here it's on an exponential scale rather than a, a linear scale. The reason is that once you get beyond around a size 20 or so, it becomes very difficult to embed these dense graphs into the D-Wave, and the embedding overhead is very large. On the other hand, the coherent icing machine does not have an embedding overhead because we have in intrinsic all-to-all -all coupling. So this is recent data we got from the icing machine at NTT. And here's some simulation that I did that doesn't quite match the NDT data because I don't think I've optimized it. So this is uh, just very preliminary. But we're very hopeful about this NDT data, and we hope to be able to fill this in and see how far we can extend the red curve. In particular, because in McMahon's paper, there was also a data point at n equals 100 for dense graphs that showed a success probability of 0.04. And you can see, of course, if this trend continues, it would be much hot much higher there. So in conclusion, we, I have introduced the coherent icing machine, which is an optical annealer that is related to quantum annealing, but is fundamentally different in many respects. Uh, we have developed coherent icing machines up to a size of n equals 2,000 with all-to-all -all coupling. And uh, we have benchmarked this machine against the n equals 1,000 D-Wave at NASA Ames for both cubic, 1D, and dense graphs. And at one, for 1D and cubic, the icing machine does well. And for dense graphs, uh, uh, sorry, for 1D and cubic, the D-Wave does well. And for the dense graphs, the icing machine does well. And we think this is mainly due to the uh, problem of embedding.
The next steps would be filling in the gaps and looking at the new D-Wave. Thank you. One question. For... Okay, lucky. Yeah, thank you very much for an interesting talk. Um, you mentioned earlier on that if you had multiple delay lines, that that was manifestly classical. There was a lot of loss, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think you went to the measure feedback approach, and there's only one delay line. And if you could make that low loss, um, can you make a statement about the level of quantumness or non-classicality of this new approach? Well, the new, because the new approach involves measurement for each round trip, it is impossible to get uh, any kind of entanglement between your pulses because that is the only thing coupling your pulses. So you cannot say that there is any kind of quantumness, at least between the pulses. On the other hand, the pulses themselves could be in squeezed states and could, that could be non-classical. Let's thank Ryan again and, um, and all the speakers in the session.